Okay, um, it's great to see quite uh, such a good audience on what must be one of the warmest days of this year. So we're all delighted that you could join us. Um, today's event has been organised to mark the 200th anniversary, the 200th the anniversary, 200th anniversary of the death of of Robert Stewart, um, Lord Viscount Castlereagh. The Castlereagh Papers, um, D3030, is one of Crony's prized collections. Um, it's probably up there, as, it's a, of international acclaim. Um, it's, we, it's one Crony owns. We procured it a, a good number of years ago when it was a lot cheaper to procure things. Um, it, it's one part of what is the is usually referred to as the Londonderry Papers, which comprises four big collections. Um, the Castlereagh one is particularly devoted to Castlereagh himself. For those of you who may be not overly aware of Castlereagh's um, legacy, he would be regarded as one of Ireland's leading statesmen, um, up there with you know the likes of Duff Lord Dufferin, Wellington. Um, he, he was foreign ambassador, he was a politician of great renown. Um, he was a assiduous supporter of emancipation for Catholics. Um, and he was also the person who brokers the Napoleon, post Napoleon, um, Napoleonic War in, in the Congress of Vienna. Um, so uh, a man of huge, um, a, a, a huge. Activities to his name. Um, he was a he was a son of um, the second Marquis of Londonderry. Um, another man of no less influence as well. So today we've got three talks. Um, the first speaker is going to be Dr. Tim Murder, who's going to be going through Castlereagh's uh, Irish um, career, and also he'll be reflecting on the death of, of Castlereagh. Brett Irwin, from who is going to be talking about the collection of Prony. And then Sarah Ungram, who's going to be talking about the conservation of the collection. And as this, this is a collection in which we've, um, as it was a grade one archive, it's received a lot of care on the conservation side. So there's a very interesting story on that. If anybody's interested, I think there's an exhibition in Mount Stewart as well, um, which you'd be... Well, I haven't seen it, but I believe it's um, it, it's open um, and to coincide with the death of Castlereagh as well. So I'm going to, just before I pass you over, just a couple of housekeeping notes. You've all been silenced. As we're muted as we enter. This is just so that there's no background um, noise and disturbance. And um, there will be a QA at the end. The three speakers are going to speak for about 15 minutes each. Tim might be for 20 minutes. Um, and that will leave about hopefully 10 to 15, a good 15 minutes at the end um, to ask the speakers any questions you have. And um, you can turn your your your, your video off um, as well. Um, if you, uh, I should also say we're recording today's um, event. So you, if you don't want your face to appear in the recording, I um, would suggest turning your video off. Okay, I'm now going to pass over to Tim. And look forward to hearing what he's got to tell us about Robert Stewart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I appreciate that. And uh, two things. One, I'm going to try to get as much as I can in today. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with Castle Ray, so I'm not going to be able to cover absolutely everything. It's an you know, expansive career, but to give some taste and overview of his career and perhaps its Irish aspects. And my second warning is uh, just a, a little technical note. I'm unfortunately babysitting or dog sitting a very ill-tempered dog who is occasionally barking. So if you hear background noise, you know, my apologies. I'll uh, I'll do my best. Hopefully that will not interfere. Now, just start with the slide. So today I'm going to just talk about um, sort of Castle Ray's what I call the Irish apprenticeship. And this term apprenticeship is often used for the earlier phase of, uh, of Castle Ray's career. In the older writings on Castlereagh, the sort of early biographies, particularly early 20th century writings about him, really the Irish sort of aspect of, of, of his political life 
is often sort of glided over within, in a chapter, whereas, you know, sort of huge amounts of space are given to his later career as a diplomat and in British politics sort of post-1800. Now, that is fair. Uh, however, there has been a sort of a corrective, corrective shift in, in, in recent years, to sort of more appreciating just how substantial his Irish career was and how much it influenced what came later. Now, to give a sort of a quick biographical uh, uh, sort of background, uh, Stephen has already done some of this. Castlereagh was born in 1769, so he's sort of a, he's a young man. He's a, he's, a, he's a child at the time of the American Revolution and its immediate aftermath, which is a, an important context. From a family of Ulster Scott Presbyterians, his father uh, was a Presbyterian. Castlereagh himself uh, was raised in that religion, although it seems he converted to Anglicanism uh, in university. His father was the MP for County Down, relatively uh, pro-reform in terms of his politics. He was an active volunteer in the 1770s. Uh, his mother, Catherine's birth mother, was the daughter of a former Lord Lieutenant, and his stepmother would be similarly well-connected in British politics, which will come up in a second. Uh, he's from a very well-connected family, and he sort of continues that tradition. It's sort of a, a recurring theme, uh, fortuitous marriages. Um, Young Robert, Robert Stewart on your screen, is educated at the Royal School in Armagh as a, as a young man, which is sort of would have been unusual for someone of his class, uh, perhaps to not be sent to a school over in England. Uh, following that, he attends St. John's College in Cambridge uh, in the late 1880s, although he uh, does not complete his degree there for reasons which are uh, sometimes debated. Uh, he returns to Ireland at the end of the 1880s to contest uh, this key event, the County Down parliamentary election of 1790. Now, that image on your screen is not relating to the election of 1790. It's actually to an event the following year, which is the celebration by the good citizens of Belfast of the fall of the Bastille. And that sort of revolutionary context is also important. Now, uh, Castle Ray, as he came to be called, young Robert Stewart, successfully uh, contested this election in 1790. Uh, once again, his family, who had a long-running rivalry with the sort of uh, magnates of County Down, the Hillsborough slash Downshire family, uh, it was a very intense uh, uh, election comp competition, but he was seated for it as a very young man in the Irish House of Commons, nonetheless. Uh, he did not necessarily make a great first impression in 1790-1791. Uh, Castlereagh always struggled in terms of his public speaking. He was not a naturally or flamboyant, uh, eloquent speaker, but he would build on his strengths as, as time went by. Uh, during a parliamentary recess in 1791-92, he took the opportunity to travel to see the effects of the recent French Revolution in both the Netherlands and France itself. Uh, he said of the French uh, and of, of France dur during the revolution in 1792, he said, I see much to approve and much to condemn but I trust that no country in which I have either a stake or affection will follow their example. And like many of, of, of his generation who sort of saw the early effects of the French Revolution this have a profound effect on his political outlook and perhaps an increasing conservatism as the years went by. Now, Castlereagh returned to Ireland in 1793 from his trips. Um, he returned just in time for war to be declared between Great Britain and France. Uh, he, he did his part by joining the newly embodied militia as a lieutenant colonel for the Londonderry militia. However, it was also at this time that he found himself drawn closer to the center of Irish politics, again, due to family connections. Uh, in, in late 1794, there was a political crisis caused by a new coalition between William Pitt the Younger and the Duke of Portland, having to sort of combine their votes to form a sort of a durable administration for the war effort. As part of the, these negotiations, Castlereagh's step-uncle, second uh, uh, Marquis Camden was appointed uh, Lord Lieutenant. Now that's not actually the first choice. The first person who was supposed to be appointed Lord Lieutenant in 1795 was Earl Fitzwilliam, a fairly liberal Portland Whig, someone who was very pro-Catholic emancipation. However, his short Lord Lieutenancy was disastrous and he alienated all the established sort of figures in Dublin Castle. Uh, he overstepped his, his um, uh, sort of his remand in terms of what he was sort of authorized to do in terms of reforming of Irish uh, government systems. So he was replaced by Camden, Castlereagh's step-uncle, who is considered comparatively a more conservative figure. Uh, given the escalation of disaffection in Ireland itself, given the ongoing war against the French, increasingly there is an emphasis on state security. Uh, counterinsurgency uh, measures and sort of the persecution, prosecution rather, of those seen as disloyal. Now, crucially, Camden 
from the very beginning had suggested Castlereagh as someone who deserved office in the new administration down in Dublin. Uh, he had actually floated the idea of appointing him as his chief secretary. However, this was actually sort of uh, uh, blocked for the time being. Instead, the appointed chief secretary was this man, Thomas Pelham, the second Earl of Chichester, someone who had been chief secretary once before in 1783. Um, and someone whose sort of career in many ways would have a huge influence on Castle Ray. So Castle Ray was denied the seat of chief secretary, this incredibly important uh, uh, function in the castle administration. Uh, the chief secretary in many ways was sort of almost more important than the Lord Lieutenant. They're in charge of not only the sort of the day-to-day -day administration of all the different various departments, they also are the government, uh, the government spokesman in the Irish House of Commons. They're there to sort of make the case for government policy. They're there to ensure votes go the government's way, to make sure uh, funding bills go through. It's a vital role. And Pelham was increasingly absent due to illness. And that would have sort of huge consequences for Castle Ray. Now, between 1796-97, you have an escalation of conditions in Ireland. Uh, notoriously, the very near miss of a French invasion at the end of 1796 with the French fleet sort of descending on Bantry Bay in County Cork. While they don't land, it sort of hammers home how vulnerable Ireland is. Escalating protests in the countryside between agrarian groups like the Defenders, the reinvention of the United Irishmen, a, uh, a, a pro-reform group that had now sort of reinvented itself as a secret revolutionary mass movement looking for a, a separate Irish Republic. All of these meant that sort of state security was top of the agenda. And Castlereagh slowly gets drawn into sort of the orbit of people like Pelham and the Castle administration. Uh, he's first made in 97, he's made Lord of Tre uh, Lord of uh, one of the Lords of the Irish Treasury, as well as being appointed to the Privy Council of Ireland, all very important uh, offices. And gradually, because Pelham is ill, he takes on some of his workload, sort of informally. Now, he also makes several key allies, people who would actually be very important for his later career. Uh, the man on your left, Edward Cook, was some, sometimes known as a bit of a sort of castle hack. He had been uh, in uh, various positions in the chief secretary's office since the 1770s, uh, although he was older than Castlereagh by a, a good 20 years. Um, uh, well, not quite 20 years, it's under. He was actually to be sort of... Uh, well, initially, Castlereagh was his protege, but then it sort of became the other way around. And Cook would sort of be a, 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 a steady presence in, in Castlereagh's li life up until Cook's retirement in 1817. Castlereagh also appointed uh, someone he admired from, from, from Londonderry, uh, Alexander Knox, a man who would later go on to have a fairly impressive career as a theological writer and thinker. He appointed him as his private secretary. Um, and these, these people were sort of key on his sort of political development over the next several very intense years. He is appointed as essentially acting chief secretary by early 1798. And of course, the year 1798 is uh, one that is pretty well known in Irish history for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, by that summer, an open rebellion had occurred, one that would kill 20,000 people by the time it, had, it, it was completely put down. Now, Castle Ray, uh, he's acting chief secretary. He's taken on most of the sort of the functions uh, of Thomas Pelham. He's serving initially under his step-uncle, under Camden, but once this rebellion breaks out in May of that year, Camden is recalled. Um, it's pretty clear they need a, another more steady set of hands, a military set of hands. And it is this man who was appointed, General Charles Cornwallis. Now, you could forgive Cornwallis if he had turned up to Dublin and expected um, from, from Castlereagh to essentially see someone who was you know, relatively untalented, someone who was here sort of because of his family connections. That's not what he discovered at all. He was immediately very impressed by Castlereagh's uh, honesty, by his hard work ethic. Um, there's actually I have a quote from Cornwallis about what he thought of Castlereagh. He said, he concealed nothing from me. He pointed out all the characters with which I knew I had to deal. And this is important. He also showed me where my predecessor had failed his predecessor being Castlereagh's own uncle, uh, which is somewhat cold on Castlereagh's part, but also someone who is not unaware of the fa faults and foibles of his relations. Now, this is actually a very controversial part of Castlereagh's career. And in many ways, the sort of the legacy or uh, sort of the shadow of 1798 would haunt him for the rest of his life. Uh, Castlereagh would acquire a sort of reputation as a bloody Castlereagh, someone who sort of was a hardliner imposing, you know, terrible sort of uh, actions against captured rebels during that summer. The truth is actually a little bit more complicated. Uh, Castlereagh was very much in, in line with Cornwallis, who was actually someone who saw 
a sort of a tempered approach, a sort of somewhat lenient approach to the rank and file of the rebellion, people who found themselves swept up in this insurrection. Uh, Castle Ray actually had to go to the bat several times to prevent much more hardline figures in, in the administration from uh, doing things as, for instance, uh, executing without trial captured United Irish leaders. Uh, Castlereagh and Cornwallis were also sort of the masterminds behind a general amnesty for rebel rank and file, one that undoubtedly pre prevented numerous deaths. However, an image would sort of seep into popular culture as a result of this rebellion. Uh, the image would always, always be of Castlereagh in his office in Dublin Castle, listening to people being flogged and tortured in the yard outside. Now, there's that there's actually very little evidence that actually happened. Now, people were tortured, people were flogged, that Castle Ray was sort of overseeing it or was so callous that he was sort of looking at it from his office window has never actually been proven. Nonetheless, this would be important for his future. By the end of the 1798, with the rebellion firmly put down, Cornwallis actually wrote to Pitt and to the London ministers saying that Castle Ray had been so crucial as an ally, he wanted him appointed to be officially chief secretary, no longer simply acting chief secretary. Now, there was actually quite a lot of sort of uh, resistance to this. Chief secretary, because it was such an important role, was something that traditionally had not been given to an Irishman. There was always a fear that someone who was actually Irish born would use it and use its power sort of for their own uh, political gain. However, and again, this is a quote from Cornwallis about Castle Ray. He is so very unlike an Irishman. And I think you can, uh, um, to London, he's saying you can you can basically appoint him. They agreed, and soon Castlereagh would be put to yet another very important task, one that again would also uh, have huge uh, implications for his subsequent legacy, which is passing the Act of Union, a measure that comes directly out of, of sort of the rebellion of 1798, the idea for a legislative union joining the British and Irish parliaments. Now, uh, the measure for a union is first introduced pretty quickly, actually. It's January of 1799 in an address to the King from the Irish House of Commons. Uh, and it's safe to say, I think it's easy to say, that uh, Castlereagh and his allies, including Cornwallis, completely underestimated the level of resistance to this measure. There is a Castlereagh himself becomes the target of a huge amount of invective in parliamentary debates. The measure fails. Castlereagh and Cornwallis now have to regroup. And for the second half of 1799, uh, they go about finding ways to perhaps build support for the measure of a union. And again, this is another sort of key aspect of sort of the Castlereagh myth and a controversy, which is a set or uh, uh, less prissy about it. Simply put, they're going to have to pay some people off. Now, this has often been sort of uh, uh, talked about in sort of more nationalist historiography as sheer bribery. But in the 18th century, the sort of the line between bri bribery and accepted use of government patronage was much more blurry. Nonetheless, Castlereagh and Cornwallis essentially embark on a, essentially a year long project in which they are making promises to key political figures for things such as plum jobs, compensation for lost seats, and elevations to the peerages. Uh, these are all very, very crucial. When the measure is reintroduced the following year, uh, it is more successful. Castlereagh has built up a following. Now, in many ways, the experience of, of the, these union debates and some of the backroom politicking that Castlereagh had to engage in would actually sort of shape his later outlook. Uh, perhaps more hard-headed cynicism sort of creeps into his outlook. Uh, the union was essentially passive, so he, so he felt not so much on making the case on ideological grounds, but on simply making sure private interests were uh, assuaged. And again, it's it's hard not to see a little bit of a legacy of that going forward when he's sort of uh, engaging in European diplomacy. Now, the Union passes on the 7th of June, 1800, but there's still two big problems left. One is making sure that the British government will honour all these promises that Castlereagh and Cornwallis had to make for jobs, for peerages, etc. There's initially some resistance to that, and Castlereagh actually threatens to resign unless they're honoured. If people are denied the things they've been promised, they'll blab. And the whole union measure will actually be sort of sullied from the get-go. It works. Pitt, Pitt's administration agrees to sort of keep, keep, keep what's being promised. But then there is a second, much more contentious issue which is being left, which is the issue of Catholic emancipation. Castlereagh and Cornwallis both had sold tacitly to Irish Catholics the idea that while 
Catholic emancipation for political equality would not necessarily be baked into the Union Act itself. It the Act of Union would allow that measure to be brought in swiftly afterwards. Very quickly, there is a backlash against that from key players, such as John Fitzgibbon, the Earl of Clare, who essentially manages to sort of get a word into the ear of King George III himself, convincing him that Catholic emancipation would actually contravene his coronation oath. The king makes it clear he will not sign off on any measure of Catholic emancipation, and in turn, both Castlereagh and William Pitt, the prime minister, resign. This was something they felt honor bound to do, considering some of the promises they had made and their strong support for the measure. Now, before I move on, and I don't want to sort of step on the toes of either Brett or Sarah, just a, a side note for anyone interested in studying more about the union debates, Prony is probably one of the key places on earth to find out about what actually happened during those union debates, because not only do you have Castle Ray's papers, one of the sort of the key players, you also have several other great archival sources for key players, the Shannon papers, the uh, Downshire papers, the Foster Masserine papers. Again, we could say more about this in another, uh, another opportunity, but if you want to learn more about what happens in 1799, 1800, Prony is the first place to start. Now, I've talked about the failure of Catholic emancipation. I will I am sort of conscious of time, so I'm going to give you perhaps a, a very quick rundown of his career in British politics, which is in many ways what more traditional accounts would have sort of done this backwards. Sort of the Irish stuff is prelude, and this is sort of where the meat is. I'm sort of suggesting that we should probably, just for the purpose of today, look at it the opposite way around. Now, Castlereagh was out of office in 1801, but not for long. Uh, under the resulting Addison, uh, Addington ministry, he was shortly appointed to the be to the, uh, uh, president of the Board of Control, which is actually sort of the department in London overseeing India and the East India Company. He returns to office uh, under Pitt's return in 1807 to be made Secretary of War in the colonies. He's only doing that for a couple of years before he leaves office in 1809. He comes back in 1812 under Lord Liverpool, where he is appointed as Foreign Secretary and leader of the House of Commons. Now he holds that post for the next 10 years, from 1812 to 1822. Uh, he is both Foreign Secretary and leader of the House of Commons. Uh, the reason for that is the Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, sat in the Lords, so he couldn't actually be in, be in the Commons. Now this is where sort of the, 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 the sort of the bedrock of Castlereagh's reputation is made after 1812. Uh, the war turns for Napoleon, his disastrous Russian campaign, his defeats at Leipzig, ultimately lead to the Allied victory of the Sixth Coalition. And in 1814-15, a meeting of European diplomats, including Castlereagh as British plenipotentiary, who essentially carve up Europe post-war, uh, post-Napoleonic War, creating a series of treaties and alliances, which come to be known as the Concert of Europe, uh, an idea that Potential interstate conflicts can be measured, can be managed through a series of congresses and meetings and diplomacy rather than the war that they had known for the previous 20 years. Much of Castlereagh's reputation amongst historians comes down to simply this form, th th this achievement in diplomacy. Uh, none other than Henry Kissinger wrote his uh, PhD and subsequently his first book on the Congress of Vienna and particularly on the role of Castlereagh. Uh, John Bew, Castlereagh's most recent biographer, also a couple of years afterwards, wrote a book called Real Politique, which gives you some idea of sort of why Castlereagh has been interested, interesting to subsequent uh, historians. Now, ironically, for all that sort of great reputation that he acquires in Vienna, post-1815, post-Waterloo, he, he is haunted by things that happened nearly 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. His actions in Ireland are still sort of brought up against him. Here are some uh, examples of satire, uh, Derry Down Triangle, Castle Ray, as one 1819 uh, pamphlet describes him, Aaron Go Bray. Uh, one person he had encountered, and I don't have time to talk about today, uh, Peter Finnerty, an Irish radical journalist who he'd encountered in Dublin in 1798, sort of comes back to haunt him. Finnerty becomes a journalist in sort of Reg Regency London and sort of harasses him with a series of pamphlets and even instigates sort of proceedings. Proceedings are instigated against Finnerty by Castle Ray in, in 1811. Again, bloody Castle Ray uh, and sort of his, his actions in his home country are continually the call. Now, because he is the government's spokesman in the House of Commons, he is the leader of the Commons, ultimately he takes the blame for a series of repressive, repressive actions that occur 
in 1819, 1820. With the fallout of the Napoleonic Wars, there's a vast economic recession. There's discontent, there's crop shortages, there's increasing protests for political reform, including most notably in Manchester in August of 1819, the meeting in St. Peter's Field, which is brutally suppressed by the local yeomanry and magistrates, leading to several deaths and hundreds of casualties. Uh, it is the event of Peterloo that leads several poets to pen lines about Castlereagh, for which he is probably best known. Uh, Shelley's I Met Murder on the Way, he had a face like Castlereagh. Lord Byron, uh, in the wake of Peterloo, pens how cold-blooded, smooth-faced miscreant Castlereagh dabbling his sleek hands in Aaron's gore. It doesn't stop there. It's not simply in, uh, invective. His reputation is traduced in the press. Fellow MPs, uh, opposition MPs bring up his actions in Ireland. He's even the target of a conspiracy in 1820 for assassination, a group called the Cato Street Conspiracy, who are actually sort of trying to uh, pick off uh, in, in one event, several cabinet ministers, and he is sort of one of the prime uh, 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 targets. Now, these years also see his general decline. And here we are coming to the end, and I'm sorry if I'm going over time. In the wake of the, sort of this, this intense period between Waterloo, between Peterloo, uh, indeed Waterloo and Cato Street, there are symptoms of decline in Castlereagh's faculties. Uh, his father died in 1821, seems to have affected him fairly badly. Uh, there are reports from several of his sort of private secretaries that his speech is declining, that he's sort of staring off into space during meetings. Uh, certainly his parliamentary performance is sort of notably declining. And then in August of 1822, uh, he really seems to come off the rails. He has a private audience with the king, which is now George IV. And George IV, of course, was the son of George III, a king who had lapsed into madness at the end of his life. And George IV is actually sort of very disturbed by what he sees. It's something very familiar, which is essentially, if not dementia, then some sort of mania. Castlereagh is ranting about plots against him, that he's been sought by the police, that he's been accused of homosexuality. Um, the king intervenes with the prime minister and says, basically, you need to give him time off to recover. Castlereagh retires to his estate in Kent that summer in August. And while his wife had attempted to keep implements such as razors, firearms away from him, uh, in the morning of August uh, the 12th, he manages to somehow secrete a pocket knife on his person. And when no one is looking, he stabs himself in, in the neck in, in, into a major vein. He dies almost instantaneously at the age of 53. Now, there are many different sort of speculations about what brought on this mania and ultimately suicide. Uh, John Bew has suggested two diagnoses, one of potentially undiagnosed syphilis from when he was a young man. Uh, another speculation is that he was actually suffering from rabies. Uh, his wife had, was a, an avid dog lover and he was actually bit in the hand several months previously. That's a possibility. There's also a much more simpler explanation, which some people have lighted on, which is simply overwork. Uh, Castlereagh was sort of at the, at the end of sort of human endurance and Suicide by public figures was not necessarily unusual in this period. It is a sort of crazy statistic, but between the years 1790 and 1820, 19 different members of the British Parliament committed suicide. It's actually quite a high number. Uh, the new stresses in, uh, of sort of governance in these years brought many to the breaking point, and Castlereagh was one of them. Now, there are loads of things I could say on top of that and sort of perhaps draw some conclusions about sort of Irish legacies on, on his later career, but I think I've sort of made that point and I'm well over time. So I'm going to pass off back to my colleague, to Sarah Graham. Hi, uh, so it's actually me. It's, I'm gonna take it on here. One second. So, good afternoon, folks. I'm going, uh, my name is Brett Irwin. I'm an archivist and prony, so I'm just going to do a brief presentation on the Castlebury papers and prony. I don't want to overlap with Tim far too much, but I'm basically looking at trying to tease out archives that represent his major jobs, his, his, his major career. So we'll just take a look at, at archives that, that reflect those jobs. But I think it's nice to start with uh, Robert Stewart, aged eight years old. I came across this letter on the 6th of October, 1777. And 
it's incredible, sort of, dear uncle, thank you for your kind letter. Presence, I am highest in my class. No boy shall get above me. Was all to study very close when not my books, but play very briskly when disengaged. Sure, my and the letter continues. Sure, my sister Fanny, smallpox. I wish she understood how much I love her and all, all my friends. Indeed, I long to see Papa and Mama soon, and my friends at Bay vacation. My love to cousin Price. And this curious line at the end of the letter is, "I am still a true American." So this struck me. Is this an eight-year-old boy espousing the? libertine values of the American Revolutionary War, which is only going two years. Or is, you know, I just had to keep, keep having to look at the sentence here. I am still a true American. It's very curious, but I'm sure no doubt him and his schoolmates, word was, was coming across of this conflict in Armand. Maybe they, they were just talking about it and uh, he became rather carried away with it. But just a very curious thing to find in an eight-year-old child. Just also to finish off with Castlereagh's uh, Teachers did speak of him being very, very spirited, but very sensitive. So from those ideas of an eight-year-old uh, to this, now the real politics in, in high, high office as the, you know, the, the acting and then chief secretary for Ireland. So we're moving along to the 1798 uh, rebellion. So one of the documents we came across here, that number there, the D303, that's the reference number of the actual document within the collection. So it's very interesting because there's a list of, so this is, a document relating to the Curra in County Kildare. And you can see on the flip side of this, the other, another page of this document, the, the intelligence information gathered about this particular area is absolutely substantial. So for example, here you have Thomas Kelly Esquire, Man's Time, supposed to know everything relative to the carriage of the United Men, but was afraid to speak out. Every man upon the Curra has a pike, they're hidden on the ground. There's 150 hand of arms hidden in Man's Town bog. And then the sign of, of being united, uh, the hands clasped, the right hand to the left hip, the words, be steady, I'm determined to free my country or die. So this incredible intelligence before this uprising of the rebellion has broken out, it's, it's quite substantial. And you can see this is just for one particular area, but you can see with the information gleaned from this document, it's not only do they have names, of people who could be potentially informers, you know a lot. They have an, an idea of the armaments held, where they're held, and then also to infiltrate the United Irish Men, they, they have these secret passes or codes into the organization. So it's quite substantial. So a world away from uh, the eight-year-old boy w wishing the American Revolution well. It's very strange. So just leading on from that, when you go to the opposition to the Act of Union, leading on from 1798, so here's an agent of Castlereagh's reporting back to him, describing the attitude of Wexford and Wicklow towards union. So he's made, made inquiry into the effects of a union with Great Britain and its kingdom on the minds of the people in general. And I'm inclined to think that the body of merchants will determine the next meeting that they have next week against it. So this is, as we can see, this is for Wexford and Wicklow towards union, but it's also interesting because it mentions that it's a class of merchants. So it's an economic reason to go against it, not the broad political terms. We often think when we think about the act of union amongst the general population, there's almost a self-serving body, a self-serving class who in this particular area would vote against it because they would fear that link with Britain and the trade disruption and prices and so on that it would cause problems. So moving on from that, this is additional, this is an army returns document. November 1804, when Castlereagh at this time is in the colonial office secretary, I think. And um, this is the, the, the additional forces act 1803, 1805. So this is for the defense of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland against the threat of seaborne invasion by the French Revolutionary Army. This created an army of reserve. This fear was very, very real and it lasted for several years. And um, for this particular, we can see in this particular document, for this month of November 1804, the soldiers enlisted for this army of reserve. And um, it's often said the Battle of Waterloo, you know, the majority of Wellington's army was Irish. Well, not I mean not quite the majority, but certainly a substantial disproportion of the amount of Wellington's army was Irish. And this snapshot here does give us an idea of the numbers enlisting from Ireland in this particular time. So England and Wales, 322. Ireland, you have 310. Scotland, you have 64. So it's a really disproportionate amount of, of, of people uh, enlisting from Ireland into the British Army. And again, this enlistment continued on and the, the army 
did eventually total something like 15,000. It did become quite a sizable force. But looking at this particular enlistments in Ireland is interesting because, you know, Armagh, you have 95 enlistments, Cavan, you have seven, Dublin City, you have 125, you'd expect large urban area, Kerry, eight, you know, Leith, 108, it's quite a lot, Monaghan, one, Roscommon, zero. So it's not quite an urban rural dichotomy. There is, it's interesting to see where certain areas did have substantial enlistments, and as in the case of Roscommon, there's zero, so some places didn't, didn't have any. Uh, Belfast is not represented on this list, so I guess at this time it, it would come under Antrim, so which would just be given as 69. Uh, it's not actually rep represented here. So this French invasion scare, this continued for several years, as I said earlier. Now, this was really in the minds of people, and some of the newspaper reports and some of the fantasy drawings and so on at the time did did were distributed around the population to create this scare, because as, as we can see here, it's almost like a science fiction kind of look. I mean, who would have thought of putting a tunnel under the, under the channel between England and France? I mean, that's just insane. That's never going go to work. You know, these, these hot air balloons flying in ar armaments, you know, these this French Navy blockade, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it did have, have a very, very powerful effect in so much for this document here, this is an agricultural survey of maritime parishes of County Down. So Mount Stewart, which is which is uh, Castle Ray's ancestral home, you know, they were actually uh, organizing our agricultural surveys of parish because people needed to know how much crops do we have, how much cows, sheep, pigs, livestock, and dead stock, as they call it, in case the French army invaded. We would know how much material and, and crops and things we have and things we have to get out of that area. So this is real, a really uh, very, very curious thing, but very, very strange. So moving on now to Castlereagh, writing to Sir John Moore. This is Sir John Moore of the Peninsula War. And Castlereagh is basically writing, writing to John Moore and saying, you know, under full persuasion of the importance of a large force of cavalry being attached to your army for the purpose of giving effect to the operation in which you are presently engaged. I cannot but regret to serve as even a single regiment of dragoons at the present moment, be divested from your immediate support. Very long-winded way of saying, I don't have any cavalry to give you because John Moore is under immense pressure in Spain because Napoleon has, after the initial setbacks of the French army in Portugal, Napoleon has launched this massive counter sweep in, in the Spain, which is blown away the Spanish army. It's a 200,000 strong French army. It's massive. Murr, uh, John Murr is fighting this very gallant rear guard retreat. And the way he's buying time is in order to get the British army, the transport ships that come and to get the British army that's there away back to Britain because they're a danger of, the, of being destroyed. So there's a little bit about Sir John Murr there, where he's first wanting to finish the war, dead at the Battle of Crinia. So this rear guard action is almost like a kind of Dunkirk feel to it, almost not the scale of Don Dunkirk, but it's that kind of thing where to hold the French back, transport ships come during the night, get the army away. Murr pays the ultimate price with his life doing this. And Marshal Soult, the French opposite number to him, spoke very highly of John Murr. And where John Murr was buried in Crania, in Galicia, in northwest of Spain, Marshal Soult had a monument put over his grave, which is there still to this day. It's a very fine statue of him in Glasgow City Centre, actually where he, where he came from. So that's that one. So let's go on. So here we have a letter from George Canning. This is a very infamous affair between Castle Ray, between two cabinet ministers, George Canning and Lord and Castle Ray. And this was going on for a while where bad blood between them and things were said. And it gets to the point where Castle Ray feels his honor is he's been dishonored by Canning. And uh, this is Canning's reply to him when when Castle Rice sets out some grievances against Canning. I said, the tone and purport of your Lordship letter, of course, precludes any other answer on my part to the misapprehensions and misrepresentations which it abounds. I will cheerfully give to your Lordship the satisfaction you, that you require. So this is two cabinet ministers. I mean, this is shocking. And I mean, there's, there's a big debate going on now for the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and it's on television quite often. So if those, that cabinet minister or former cabinet minister were just to say i'm fed up you know putney green 6 a.m pistols at dawn that, that would be absolutely shocking so it's a shocking it's, it's shocking then as it would be now so this is this duel where castle county fired missed and then uh castle fired back and hit george canning on the on the thigh he recovered so this is when uh 
1814, this is prisoners of war in Great, Great Britain. We're just moving along now um, to another one of Castlereagh's posts. This is now the Foreign Secretary sort of era for Castlereagh. But it's interesting because when you look at this document, you think, okay, French prisoners of war in 1814, absolutely. But Danes, Americans, so, well, you know, there was, I mean, Britain was had a brief battle in Copenhagen in 1807. So they, they must be presumably Danish sailors that were captured still, you know, seven years later, still in, held in Great Britain because that continental system blockade is still an op operation that Denmark was a part of against Britain. So that's why for that. And then, you know, it's interesting when Castlereagh's boy is talking about I'm a true American. There's a war in 1812 with America. There's a, the second war with, with America with with Castle overseas and has to supply, it has to get an army out there and has to get them supplied and all that thing. So he's these American sailors are captured and, and Marines and are held in Britain. And what's interesting about this, this is the main of the hulk of the prison ships. If we move it to the next document, are the, the prisoners of war in Great Britain, and it shows you how widespread they are from parts of Wales to North Scotland and the border regions to the Southeast England. And then when I was looking down at this document, I seen in Peebles, which is a little village in the borders of Scotland, there's one American. So one American sailor is held in Peebles. I mean, that's, why do we not know about the story? That's just, I mean, there must be a story there. It's absolutely fascinating. And I'd be, I'd be very intrigued if I could find out more about that. So, Let's see where we are. So we're of time here. So Napoleon's escape from Elvis. This is the, the famous period known as the Hundred Days. So Congress of Vienna is in full swing coming to the end of the Napoleonic Wars to try and resolve post, pre, post our Napoleonic Europe back together again. Napoleon sees otherwise and decides to leave his island prison, as it were, in Elba and come back. And this mad dash that finally ends in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. But when he came back and the, the you know people didn't know it was going to end at the Battle of Waterloo, there was still not again a, a sense of here, here we go. And this is an interesting letter in the Council of Papers because this is one of the declarations that was sent to the to the diplomatic teams in Vienna. So this sort of declaration in form A, the invasion that Napoleon Bonaparte to squeeze my French, but he's back, he's invading, he's the main army, he's back in France. So I'm sure there was a few shudders and shivers when the diplomats and their teams read this. Although the main diplomatic teams in the capital cities, say in Berlin, Paris, London, Vienna, they would have known that he, he was back. Word did get out. Didn't officially trickle into the Congress till a few weeks later, but the capital cities and the and the and the teams there, they would have known that that he, he was back. And there was immediately, almost immediately, launched a massive. Russian Austrian army coming to Western Europe to, to counter this threat. But you could still maybe think people reading this document, just thinking the head in their hands, here we go. Because we've spent the last 10, uh, by this stage, eight months trying to put Europe back together again. All these complications of the, of the Congress of Vienna, again, it's sort of satirized quite a lot, like Gato de Ra, the, the cake of kings, a big slice up, you know. So everyone's wanting to get their, their piece of Europe. There's like, presumably it's Castlereagh in the middle with the money, with the scales holding the money. So the Napoleon's wanting to take back France. You know, it's like Alexander of Russia wanting Poland. Uh, the Austrians wanting parts of uh, Italy. You know, all these, everyone has an agenda. And I think one of the one of the kind of aspects where Castlereagh is, is, is really known for is his diplomatic efforts at the top table and his relationships to ensure the power balance. And Tim mentioned this at the end of his talk, but the balance was established and Europe was kind of put together again because these issues, post Poland, France, post Poland, Spain, Swiss Confederation, German states, Saxony in particular, Holland, Belgium, Italy, Poland, Russia, massive problem, slave trade. These were these weren't going to be, be resolved easy. And it's, it's the, this work of Castle Rise that did put this Europe back together again in a way that peace more or less lasted that did the, the concert of europe did ensure, ensure that europe was held together for a hundred years although there was wars and with you know i suppose the, the, the crimean war in the 1850s with which is more of a dispute between russia and france over the ottomans that britain kind of joined in on but by and large this held so i'd just like to say thank you very much for your time folks okay right 
I am fairly unapologetically document heavy in this presentation, um, being from, from conservation. Um, yes, we've had the, the uh, life of Carson Ray, and now we've got his, his archive. The Carson Ray collection is one of Prony's key archives, and the pres preservation of it is a primary resource for research as an ongoing and, and active process. Um, it slows down the deterioration and it limits wear and tear from access. As the papers were only selectively published, it's lovely seeing Stephen, Brett, Tim, and other researchers in the reading room consulting the papers in their entirety. And here I'm going to show how the steps Prony has taken um, to keep the full set of original letters safe and available um, since they were deposited with us in 1974 or 76, depending on how you're counting. Um, the conservation work on this collection was probably the largest project carried out by the conservation section. It was worked on by at least six conservators over almost 30 years and was so significant that it was even noted in the catalogue description. As such, it covers a period of time when training and conservation supplies were becoming increasingly available and shows developments in, in technique. It spans the time from skilled binders and repairers at Prony to conservators. So the physical extent of the collection. The catalogue has quite a thorough description of the collection, but in preservation collections management, we tend to refer to item levels and location data of the record. So there are about seven, so there are 7,657 entries, six and a half thousand of which are the Castle Ray papers, and the other thousand refer to letters, volumes, newspapers, and parchments under additional material. The papers were bound um, into 39 volumes and then rebacked in the 1930s. As the catalogue notes, the Prony's conservation section removed the letters from the volumes into which they were bound with a destructive glue and in a way which made photocopying almost impossible. The originals were photocopied and the photocopies were tipped into the volumes and the volumes returned to the study in Mount Stewart. The originals were then bound in Prony's own guard books. This is interesting because the collection now no longer physically reflects the units created at the time. Um, and this is only reflected in the Arabic pagination. The photocopying of the letters and their removal from the binding was the cause of interventive treatment as the adhesive needs to be removed and the spine edge of the letters needs to be consolidated. So what were the housing solutions for these letters? The red leather and green buckram bindings were the first designed to attach the letters to a guarded volume. They were formed by sewing blank sections and cutting away the paste to create a guard for the letter. There are a lot of blank sections at the back, implying that the batches of letters in each binding could have been much larger had they wished to make them so. After the first two volumes, we then start seeing the recognisable crony guard books I mentioned in the catalogue which we see across our key archives and date to the mid 1980s. They were favored in many archives as a mechanism of document security and embedded in studio-based training. The letters are either adhered or sewn onto single guards, which are then gathered onto posts. I think brass posts, but I've not been able to see them to confirm. Several documents were released from the binding for the Active Union exhibition in 2001 which further reinforces these guard books as a functional stationery rather than a deliberate, a deliberate curated collection of letters as they probably were previously. The second half of the letters were kept in, deta in detached bundles. Um, as they were treated in the early 2000s, I suspect that the connection with the original bindings had become diluted. And this would have been a more minimal approach that was, um, um, a high priority in, in sort of conservation ethics at the time. The detail of conservation documentation varies. It's fairly limited in the 1980s, but more detailed in the early 2000s, where we can see the clear impact, impact of training um, that the conservators received from the Society of Archivists. So for consistency, I carried out a quick survey to familiarize myself with the collection with the help of Jordan from Document Production. It's about 50-50 between guard books and bundles with the red and green volumes and fascicules, which we'll, which we'll see later, um, as a bit of an outlier. As you can see from the table, um, loose letters and the additional materials also conserved. These are the references with capital letters in them. 
you would think modifications of, to the letters would have occurred during these treatments. However, in the early letter, um, however, the early letters, when the early letters were treated in the, the green and red bindings, the removal of the historic repairs was not quite so rigorous. And we can see a layering of these repairs, for instance, in, in the top left corner, um, a tissue with a synthetic adhesive over a silk repair. Um, also a waxy texture to some of the documents and brush marks, which you can hopefully see on the right pages um, from a fairly viscous um, liquid being applied. This is where researchers are really helpful because you are my eyes in the collection. And Tim had previously highlighted to me the extent of fading of the inks, which could have been caused by some of these solvents, which makes it a really interesting area of um, further research, which I look forward to looking into. But what were Prony's treatments? Um, the, at Prony, the conservation was undertaken by document repairers who had come from other roles within the archive and to be trained in the studio. The early documentation of the letters may initially only have said conserved, guarded and filed, or conserved, decidified and sized. But we still see the conservators using adhesives that aren't discolouring with age and starting to identify the paper mill. They have taken care to taking care to repair tears which could easily have extended further and been quite creative about how they avoid written sections. The thickness of the paper, however, is causing them some problems. Silking was a solution for, transpar for transparency, which was still used in some studios when I was training. Often used over inks, which are unstable because the ink is corroding through the page. However, they went out of fashion with the growth of conservation science, as you can see that their age of properties proved to be comparatively poor. So the introduction of transparent heat set tissues, which we see on the right, seemed a great, great new material. Um, its application here might be a little bit um, heavy handed because um, it's quite rigid, but it looks like the paper was damaged by mold and had felted. And so that's why this double layer of, of lamination was, was um, attempted. Work seemed to stop between 1985 and 1999 when conservators picked up the project again and kept letters as bundles. The main drawback of loose bundles is a long term storage, and if the envelopes are too small, they can crease and tear at the edges. Along with idosing, grouping letters on the catalogue, uh, grouping letters in the catalogue, preservation staff will now go through and look at rehousing them in larger envelopes, which should fix that, that problem. The letters themselves were cleaned, washed, and deacidified with calcium hydroxide. We see Florentine repair technique written in the documentation. And this refers to methods which were developed in 1966. At the time, there was a massive response within the profession to wash and repair books that were damaged by the dirty flood water. The cast ray papers here were repaired with Crompton, uh, oh no, sorry, I wasn't the right thing. Um, with Crompton Arch Archibald or Filmoplast R tissue. These repair papers are a lightweight manila tissue pre-coated with a stable acrylic adhesive still marketed to the archive sector today and are very quick to apply. We don't use them in the studio anymore because they need to be heated with a tacking iron and are only reversible with IMS. Instead, we use either fresh paste repairs or a moistable tissue, which can be activated or, and reversed with minimal humidity. What is lovely to see is the conservators finding appropriate occasions to try out the application of wet paste, which might require a bit more skill, but is more flexible with other treatments. We also see 16 letters fascicled. This dates it to after um, 1995 when the article by Christopher Clarkson came out. It was a technique that he developed at the Bodleian uh, and it was an alternative to guarding and filing. Um, it was very popular because it had the advantage of a comfortable wide opening, but in a collection this big would be prohibitively time consuming. So, Towards the end of the survey, I came across the, a surprise, which um, perhaps par paradoxically pleasing to see, is untreated bundles. And you'd expect, you know, um, that to be a disadvantage. But untreated bundles give us a control sample to the spectrum of, of archival conservation treatments which were used here. 
there is almost 40 years of unintentional, of unintentional natural aging data. And now with a digital camera in the studio, we can add a photographic, photographic record of the condition of the letters before treatment. And just because I always have to talk about iron galling, <laughs> um, they're, um, mainly because they're so ubiquitous in all our collections, given that they were popular from the Middle Ages right through to the 19th century. A collection of this scale demonstrates many of the accelerants to corrosion um, that, that we come across. So on the left, we have the proximity of the ink to an acidic paper. In the middle, we have a more saturated, more saturated ink where the nip has weakened the paper substrate. Um, and just below that in the middle is where the ink itself has, has burned through on, on the opposite page. And on the right, we have examples of different recipes of inks responding differently to the exact same storage condition, you know, because they're on the same page. So the main change from 2006 to the current studio is that there are less projects where a single approach to treating documents would be applied to a collection. Preservation rehousing would be collection wide, but interventive treatment would be on a more individual basis. Also, Whilst each of the storage formats have a different impact on their vulnerability when handled, I don't think the decision was made from the perspective of the reading room conditions and access, as it would be today. It would, be it would have been considered that conservation was finished when the document left the studio. However, conservation and preservation are now more closely linked, and the way that researchers are consulting the records is built into the treatment. Rather than, my, rather than in this case, where it was microfilmed and then the collection was closed, supposedly. Um, this is also why when I go through the reading room, I ask uh, researchers to use book cradles and embrace document handling so that they can be accessed easily and remain in good condition. That's me. <laughs> Thank you.